This is Marketing Fundamentals with Bob. Topic 11, Developing and Managing Products. Well, folks, um, pretty simple matter of fact. Innovation and leadership in new product development is absolutely essential to the long-term growth and viability of the organization. Having said that, you don't just go out and introduce new products just for the sake of introducing new products. And by the way, I will make a note on this as well. Keep a very wary eye in a big company on brand groups and advertising agencies. The brand groups get themselves really famous in the company and build their portfolio by creating new brands. Ad agencies make a whole bunch of money by new ad campaigns. That's their vested interest. It may or may not be in your company's best interest to be going down that path. So just be kind of very careful of that. With that in mind, let's take a look at some of the categories of new products that we, we deal with. There are very few uh, new to the world products, AKA discontinuous innovations. Um, a discontinuous innovation might have been something like uh, telephone, TV, the internet. Having said that, something has got to be new about the product. Um, I might have a product improvement uh, coming out with a food without trans fats. Uh, might have addition to existing product line. Cox Cable adds 3D cable. Um, I got a new flavor ice cream. Maybe I've got a new scent of air conditioner. I can't though just come out and say we've got the new uh, 2015 model of such and such a product uh, without making any difference other than the year of the product. I've got to change something. With that in mind, let's go through this whole process of what we do in developing new products and what the whole process involves within this. The whole, the whole new product strategy begins with idea generation. <clears throat> that is a continuous search for new product ideas which are consistent with the target market and the organization's needs. Now, I want input from everybody in this, well, just about everybody in this. Um, I certainly would li like to hear from my employees, particularly my sales force, uh, anybody who deals with my customers and the channel partners, and I'd like to deal with the channel partners and the customers themselves. I'm probably not going to pay too much attention on idea generation to my accountant or my banker or something like this. They've always got great ideas, but they're not part of the business. I'm not going to hear about that. But I'll brainstorm this. And when I brainstorm, I will consider anything. We'll be in a brainstorming session. We'll come up with an idea. Well, maybe we could do this. OK, we'll write it down on a piece of paper. We'll put it up on the wall, see what we think about this thing. We'll go around and around, and all of a sudden, someone will come back. Wait a second, that thing we had over here, this idea here, maybe that could work. I wish I had been in the brainstorming session the first time someone came up with the idea that we could package and, and market a pet rock. I would just like to know what the first thinking on that was. And that's why in a brainstorming session, you don't knock anything. We listen to anything. We're not going to laugh at it. We might welcome back to it and say, hey, you know, you might be able to sell a pet rock out here or something. But then we go to go to the next step to idea screening. I'm going to double check this thing, these ideas for um, basically compatibility with the organization's objectives and the markets and the overall marketing strategy and my ability to implement it. Um, like, for instance, a magazine publisher might be thinking about, we could publish maps. Let's get the business published back. We can easily print the maps. Yeah, except they're located in a different section of the store, and you might not have the technology to be able to get the information and keep it updated to, to get the process done. Printing, it's the easy part. Figuring out what to print's the tough part. Might not be consistent with what you do. Uh, within this, then, uh, we basically are, I may well, at this particular stage, to look at things like concept tests. They're cheap. We just go out of here. Uh, I, this is before doing a business analysis or, uh, or creating a prototype product. I just take an idea and I run it past um, groups of potential customers, perhaps in the form of a focus group. Just say, what do you think of this thing? Uh, Mattel might do this for um, basically looking at three new toy trucks they're considering. They'll put a bunch of toy trucks out there and say, what do you think about this? What do you think? Would you like this? What do you think of it one way or another? On an ad campaign, we do this in the form of a storyboard. This is interesting. To create a high quality uh, television ad is an expensive proposition. So before you go through the production and all the rest of the stuff of putting the thing together, what, we get some guy up in a, in, in a corner office someplace that's a good artist, and he draws like the Sunday cartoons, and you draw out like a page that looks like a Sunday cartoon. Here's the action, here are the characters, here are the things they say, here's the description. Now someone can draw this out at virtually zero cost in a couple of hours, run this potential, commercial, 
by a group of, of, of potential audiences and say, what do you think about this? They may say, hey, this is really cool. They might say, this is really stupid. Well, if they think it's really stupid, it's a nice time to find that out before you invested a whole lot of money in this thing. Then we get down to the point of the business analysis. At this stage in business analysis now, I can run the numbers. Um, I got to forecast my sales, my profits. Uh, I do a break-even analysis. We get to pricing, we'll talk about break-even. But essentially, break-even says, how many have I got to sell? How long is it going to take before I make up my fixed costs and I'm in the black? Uh, within this, you better consider some things as well. What's the impact uh, likely to be on your present product line? In other words, am I going to cannibalize existing lines uh, for the sales I get here? What's the likely competitive response? It's just sort of like, isn't this kind of like preparing for a war, is it not? Uh, and it's marketing, it's kind of marketing warfare. And so I'm going to consider that. If I do this, what's competition likely to do? Can they come out with a matching product in 90 days? Or can they do it overnight? That's a big difference, one way or another. Now, the next time I get to, I know, okay, still looking good. I now go in and actually develop something, do the engineering on it. I may at this point produce a prototype product that's getting a little more expensive now when I start to get into something highly technical. I uh, might now be able to test it in the lab with potential customers. Um, but at this point, if it still looks good, now I start to raise the questions of going to the next step in which I'm really going to incremental cost. If I've spent a million dollars through development, the next stage, test marketing, is likely to be 10 million. 10 times the cost. I better be really sure that this thing looks pretty good before I go to test marketing. And in test market, I'm introducing it into a limited number of areas, probably two to four cities, to kind of monitor the reactions of potential customers to the product in, and the marketing program in an actual market situation. When I do this, I'll use different combinations of variables. I'll use different pricing, uh, different promos, different advertising levels. Uh, remember your stat courses on analysis of variance? Uh, that's what I do. I don't put the same program in four markets. I'll have advertising high in one market, promotion low in another, and I'll kind of mix and match the variables. So after looking at four markets, I should be able to come through and say, okay, this is the price, this is the wholesale, this is the ad level, this is the intro deal we need to make to make this thing go. When I do this, uh, I might tend to use typical heartland cities, uh, Oklahoma City, uh, Columbus, Omaha, might not. Uh, I might, for instance, a product, a product targeted at the Hispanic market. I'm probably going to go southeast, southwest in that case. The key to the thing is, though, your test market basically should reflect the demographics and the purchasing patterns of what your target market is going to be. Now, as I say, you're getting into big bucks now when you start getting into test marketing. So a lot of people, when they get to this point, say, well, let's not go out with a whole test market. Let's kind of do the next best thing to a test market uh, at your peril. They might do a simulated or a laboratory market test. So what I might do, um, I might have my target consumers might view a retail ad. They uh, look at promo materials. They might shop a real or a mock store, and we see what they buy. Ain't going to work, people. That sort of thing is appropriate only if you're doing one variable comparisons. If I want to compare what's the, what's the sales of Coke at... Um, 349 versus Pepsi at 299 versus the same price, 349, 349, 299, 299. I can check one variable by having a pre-test, post-test, control group, test group to test one variable in, uh, in, in a sort of a laboratory condition. Go back to marketing research. That's what we're talking about there. For one, you can't go through and do basically a, the equivalent to the information you need to get in a test market situation in a laboratory test. You save a few bucks, you get no information. So you're going then into a commercialization, you got no idea what's the appropriate price, ad level, what kind of trade deal do we have to make, you got no idea on that stuff. So you're going to the next level here, you don't have the data you need to have. You need to make the decision, if you're gonna go to, to the next level, you're gonna have to invest, invest the money. So make sure you wanna go to that next level. And we're going to come into that point in just a moment. Because next, if you think it's working in, in test market, you now go to the last stage in this thing, and that is commercialization. Full-scale launch. We're setting the thing out here. Now, here's the thing on setting out full-scale launch. For commercialization, com consumer non-durables, 90% of new product ideas fail before you get to commercialization. And of those who do get to commercialization, 
90% of those uh, have failed or are dogs that should be deleted within one year. Meanwhile, the costs that you're incurring in time uh, are, and dollars are just increasing exponentially as you go on at every step, especially once you get to the test marketing stage. A million dollars through development, 10 million at test market, 100 million at uh, full scale launch commercialization. So what you gotta do with this whole process? Your mindset. I have got to eliminate unsuccessful products as soon as I possibly can in the process. My mindset has got to be, if they're ultimately gonna fail, let me shoot them now. I have run across one student in all my time in teaching that knew of the product that, that Coca-Cola introduced my first year at Coke, um, and it is Simba. Have any of y'all ever heard of the product Simba? Simba, it conquers the African thirst. Simba is Fanta lemon soda. It is carbonated lemon soda. It's basically the same thing as Windex and carbonated lemonade. So the product was all tested out, people like the product. So they come out with Simba, it conquers the African thirst. Um, in showing it though, in the commercial they had for it, they had the lion, that lion was okay, and they had a white guy going through Africa. A white guy wearing the whole Africaner outfit and the pith helmet, the whole thing. And some of us young progressives at the company at the time kind of went to the brand manager and said, you know what? Um, some of our black customers might be highly offended by this white guy representing the African thirst. So they said, yeah, we'll check that out. So they did taste tests among white customers and black customers. Taste tests. And said, no, they like it. They, they, they like it just as well. So they, they decide we're going to roll this thing out. I was part of the test market. We did it in um, Columbus, Toledo, Providence, and Seattle. I even got a, I got a full week in Seattle. Flew out to Seattle just to do, do a legitimate research test, uh, going in vendors uh, in and around Seattle area. And we take out a Sprite button, replace it with a Simba button, and one, we take out a Fanta button, replace it with a Simba button, another one. Uh, other vendors we'd leave alone. We try to look what the sales were. Didn't do all that much. Uh, meanwhile, we had the brand manager for Simba. He was so gung-ho on this thing. He was a Freeman Robinson. He was walking around with, wearing the Africaner outfit with a pith helmet all around the outfit, all around the office. We couldn't hardly miss the guy. So anyhow, we, we run the numbers on this thing. Um, we try to see uh, exactly what we think it'll sell. Keeping in mind now, these four markets we were in are company-owned plants. So they're, they're relatively strong and, and we can control what happens and we're running very high levels of intensity and promotion for the product at the time. So I ran the numbers on it, and um, the numbers basically said that of the people who bought Simba, uh, we could probably get maybe 0.1 cans per month out of them. And I projected, when I did the numbers, that if we rolled it out on a national level, and meanwhile, of course, the numbers we're having are high because of the, the, the markets we're in, the intensity we're giving it. But based on the same level, just to roll it out with the same sales per population, we would sell six million cases a year. Submitted the data and all this. So uh, my boss comes back to me. He says, uh, we can't have six million. We gotta have at least 25 million because they've already decided to roll it out and they need 25 million to justify it. So I'm a whore. So, okay, I can do that. So I took the 0.1 cans per month, and I said, well, that could run from 0.025 to 0.4 cans per month, and I only used the number at the high end, the 0.4, which gave me 26 million cases uh, in national distribution. So how long do you think it took me to do that? No, 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 no. It took me four days, four days. You've got to make it look as if you spent some time on analysis of it. It's sort of like when I was doing my dissertation at Georgia, I was at a point with, uh, with something they were raising some question about, but I need to think through the next step in the, in the research and all this. So I, I went home, got on my old Selectric, typed, typed it out, um, brought it back in the next day, and the reaction was, well, you can't have it yet. You haven't immersed yourself in it. You need to immerse yourself in it. So I came down to Pensacola for the week and just lay out on the beach and drank a whole bunch of beer, came back and went back to Athens and submitted the exact same piece of paper. Now that's more like it. You've given it enough time to immerse yourself. So keep that in mind when you're doing analysis and stuff. You give them enough days. And so I, we introduce it um, with the numbers, roll it out. You can guess what happened. The thing just died on this thing. Yeah, okay, but they had to learn. That's how they did the thing here. Another thing to consider on it, as we've talked about previously, how about cannibalization? 
Um, Got to consider that, especially if you're in a line extension. And in fact, the, the reality was, uh, especially in the vendors, if I'm taking out a button to the Fanta and putting in a button to Simba, I'm robbing Peter to pay Paul. I'm not getting anything else. Uh, also here, if, you, if, it's, if it is a line extension, am I impacting the positioning on my, uh, on my flagship brand? So we, we think about why new products haven't failed. Well, for one thing, they may have no advantage vis-a-vis -vis existing alternatives. There's, there's no reason to buy them. Uh, might have positioned them improperly. I should be positioning this to teenage girls instead of uh, older men. Um, may have failed execution and distribution and getting the product out there. Like for one thing, maybe I can't meet demand for the product. Um, you hear about this in a lot of electronic stuff. They, that product doesn't work well. They can't get it out there fast enough. In the old days, there was a company that decided they were going to go gung-ho with a, a, new, uh, a new product on tapioca pudding. I kind of like tapioca pudding, frankly. But they're going to go a big, big old thing on tapioca pudding. So they're, they're out with it. They've got all the sales projection. They're really gung-ho. They're going out and promoting it and everything else like that. Uh, you know, one little problem with this. There's a, really, there's a key in, ingredient in tapioca pudding. Guess what it is? Yeah, tapioca. And there's only so much tapioca in the world. I think it comes from someplace out in Southeast Asia or something like that. They couldn't meet the demand for the product. There's no way they could, they could make this thing fly. You might have, especially electronic stuff, technical problems, a flawed product or something. Your timing. You might be too late. The competitor has already gone in and got the distribution and got the position in the customer's mind on this product. Or you're too soon. The Sears catalog, there's a classic case. The Sears catalog, going back in the 30s, every farmhouse in America had a Sears catalog and a Montgomery Ward catalog in it. And right on their coffee table in the living room. Uh, interesting. <coughs> the Sears catalog was a quarter inch smaller on both its height and width than the Montgomery Ward catalog. Why would that be? Good execution implementation. It was a little bit smaller. It was always on top. But it got to be the early 90s, and <clears throat> Sears is coming up and saying, ah, catalog's dead. People just ain't buying through the catalog anymore. People are just not going to buy from home anymore. You see where this is going. So they decided to eliminate the catalog just too soon. Eliminated the catalog just before online came on, when they could have made a transition from the catalog to online sales, just got rid of the thing too soon. Now, assuming that most people will adopt innovative products and services and ideas, and you know how we spell assume, A-S-S-U-M-E, because when we assume, we make an ass out of you and me. But assuming that most people adopt them, let's look at our categories of adopters. <clears throat> and within this, we have first category as innovators. And innovators, by definition, are eager to try new products and ideas. Don't worry about <clears throat> memorizing the numbers on this. Oh, look at that. 2%. 2% is nothing. Yeah, it's nothing. It may seem like nothing. It's just 2%. But these are the people who first try it. These are the first people who first get introduced to the idea. They're different. They're weird. This is like one of my colleagues was on the internet in 1994. Yeah, but these are the first people that get to it. They're young, they're better educated, they're higher income, they're more cosmopolitan. They are different, they're not restrained by group and community norms. These are the people that first get the thing out there. And they're, they're not getting their information through, uh, through the public media, they're kind of getting it from experts and scientific sources. The next group you got there, these are the ones that really you kind of focus on more than anything else as, for, as how impactful they will be, the early adopters. Now, they're about, something like about 14% of the total. So what we're saying is maybe you get about one, pe one person out of six that's going to ultimately adopt the product has by the time they get through the early adopters. So we're still really early in the process. But here's the thing about the early adopters. They're more oriented to group and community norms and values than are the innovators, and they're respected by others, and they're your likely opinion leaders. When you reach them, you're now going to be in a position to sort of start to really move it out. <clears throat> the innovators won't affect that many people. The early adopters will. The early majority, this is a big group. This is about a third of the people who will ultimately adopt it. By the time the early majority's got it, we're probably talking half the people who will ultimately adopt have adopted it now. They're a little different in how they do things. They're more deliberate. They're going to collect some information. They're going to evaluate more alternatives. They're going to wait till the price comes down to a little bit better level before they decide to buy it. But these are your solid middle-class citizens. 
for a product that's going to get pretty good diffusion throughout society, by the time you get to this point that half the people who will ultimately adopt it have done so, your product is pretty much part of the American lifestyle. <clears throat> Similar thing, we have the late majority, this too, large group, it's also about a third of the people who will ultimately adopt. <clears throat> We're now up to about 84% of those people who will ultimately adopt have done so by now. They tend to be, be very careful about, tend to be older. Yeah, they're probably older. Below average income and education, maybe not. Uh, <clears throat> because in fact, looking at this, like your grandparents or great grandparents were probably very slow to uh, adopt to the internet until they finally said, oh, you got you got to adopt this so we can send you pictures of the kids um, on the internet and stuff like this. Okay, they're, they're more traditional and conservative, yes, but many people like this, are just, they're just older and out of touch. They may not be below average income and education. Uh, not all of them, not at all. But they're skeptical of new products and services and kind of responding to the social and peer pressure to conform, like the, grand, the, the grandkids want to be able to send the pictures to granny. Laggards, Small percentage, about 16% of the total. This gives you the last one-sixth of the people who will adopt it. These people tending to be suspicious of new products and ideas, tend to be alienated by a rapidly changing society. And then, of course, you get the non-adopters who don't never adopt no matter what. Um, I, I have never yet sent a tweet. I do not have a Facebook page. I want nothing whatsoever to do. Um, with having uh, most of these things, uh, certainly like a cell phone, there ain't no way I'm gonna have a cell phone. There ain't no way I don't want a cell phone. I, well, I've got my home, I've got my office, it's got an answering machine, the rest of the time, leave me alone. <clears throat> now, th all this thing, the adopter categories are very, very useful in marketing segmentation, folks. Think about this. It kind of helps you say, if I'm early in the process, it kind of tells me who I'm going after and what my strategy might be. We'll get more and more into this as we get, get in the last few topics here. But it also helps me make adaptions to my marketing mix uh, over time as I move through the, and I now need a drum roll please to bring up the product life cycle. The product life cycle is one of the key points we have in marketing. Um, <clears throat> it is a graphic description of the sales history of product category, brand, or product item. And now we're beginning to get to some strategy here. Uh, the shape in this thing may not be a bell curve at all. It may, the, the shape may vary. The length of the stages may vary considerably uh, by product, by category, by brand. <clears throat> Changes in the product can affect the product life cycle. And by the way, decline is not inevitable. Uh, you just support the existing products. I don't see a decline on internet. I don't see a decline on overnight delivery of packages, or air travel. Don't see it at all coming. So may not be. But stage by stage, in the intro stage, that's when I'm just getting into this, I'm investing, by definition, money in the intro stage in hopes of future profits. Now, within this, I've got to have a physical product, I've got channel incentives to get my distribution, and for advertising and promotion, I'm going in what we call primary demand, if and only if you're first. That's when, that, and primary demand is saying, try the category but only if you're first. Then we get next into the growth stage. Growth stage, traditionally, we've got <clears throat> sales are growing fast, profits tend to emerge and peak, and then begin to decline. Now, that is generally because profits may never emerge. Going back to the internet bubble of, of 2000, we had all these companies coming in, these new internet sites that are going to be just so, so great. And um, the problem with that, of course, is your new internet site, someone else can introduce the internet site in 24 hours, and <clears throat> they went into their growth stage and no profit ever. They never made any money. But here's the thing. In the growth stage, I'm not alone in the marketplace anymore. And so what I'm looking at in my advertising and uh, promotion is secondary demand. Secondary demand says, try my brand. Primary demand is when you come in first, you got to introduce them to the category, try the category. Now, I'm going with secondary demand, and it's try my brand, and so I'm emphasizing my brand's benefits and positioning. Now, if you're, if you're second in the market and you're not first, you may be in the intro stage for your brand, but you're still, your advertising promo is secondary demand, try my brand. You get primary demand only if you're the first one out there. Maturity stage. Uh, now, at this point in, in, in maturity stage of it, the early part of maturity stage, we tend to see sales increasing at a decreasing rate. The latter part of the maturity stage, um, sales begin to decline. Now, here's the thing you get. 
you're often getting yourself heavy promo in this area to kind of fight for market share and stave off the decline stage. Category's not growing anymore. You've got to get your sales from the competitor. We can't grow with an increasing size of pie. So we find this in the maturity stage for things like soft drinks. Uh, soft drink market is not really growing now. Coke can't grow the market. Coke is going to have to take it from Pepsi. Pepsi is going to have to take it from Coke. So there's pretty heavy promos that go on in this. In fact, it's very interesting. The, uh, the, level, the, 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 the cost of a 12-pack of, a of Coke is pretty close to what it was 20 years ago. And it cost a whole lot more to make it and distribute it than it did then, but it's a mature category. They're fighting it out. They're only making their money in single bottle sales, actually, on this thing. But here's the, here's the marketing opportunity in this mature stage. Niche entries come in here. Coffee. Coffee has been a mature product and steadily declining since the 50s. But you've got Starbucks. And you've got in the beer. Beer has been steady or, uh, pretty much for 40 years. But yeah, but you've got the, you the micro brews. They're coming in there. So here's the thing to think about. Again, I, I, I have to emphasize this. Your opportunities are the one and two percent markets. And even for a mature product, yeah, you can win there with a niche entry. Then we come in, decline stage in the marketplace. Uh, new products replacing the old at that point. Um, might have a core group of loyal users. Might have me a cash cow. So I've got, to that point, I might have me something like um, uh, DVD rentals or something like that. Uh, or I'm the last player in a dying segment. Uh, I got carburetor repair. Um, I still, I still can get the IV, IVs are still able to get my carburetor on my on the '79 couplers repaired. My four barrel carburetor, they can still get it done. But I, ha I think they're having to do it in shop now because I'm not sure there's any place around here you can get uh, get carburetor repair, uh, typewriter repair. When I when I got rid of the the elect this electric back in '99. There was one place in Pensacola you could get typewriter repair. There was no place in the city of Chicago you could get typewriter repair. Poor mom, she couldn't get her typewriter repaired. But sometimes it's a dog. It's time to just get out of this thing. And, of course, uh, the, the, the rate of sales decline is going to be affected by how rapidly consumers' tastes change and substitutes products are accepted. So, that's topic 11. And this is Marketing Fundamentals with Bob.